Hey, this is Dave Pryor. Welcome to Leading Agile Sauna. Today, we're going to talk all about PEACER. That's an acronym that we use at Leading Agile. We're going to talk about what this is, how it helps with Agile transformation, and to assist me in this conversation, Melissa Oberg and Dennis Stevens are here. So thank you both for making time for this. Yeah, it's good to be here, Dave. It's great to be here, Dave. Um, before we jump into the topic and explain what PEACER actually means... Um, Melissa, would you mind introducing yourself to the folks? Because we've not done an interview before, and I'd like them to know a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, so my name is Melissa Oberg. Um, I'm a principal consult- consultant at Leading Agile. I've been here for, uh, wow, four years now. Uh, prior to, to being a consultant at Leading Agile, I was actually a client of Leading Agile a, a million years ago. So Dennis and I have been working together for a really long time now. Um, And I am super passionate about transformation, uh, especially when it comes to getting things to execute and execute really well so that we can show value for our clients. All right. And that's that's kind of a tall order with transformation, because a lot of times they kind of swerve all over the road unless you've got some specific way of approaching it. Right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. And Dennis. Hey, Dave. Hey, everybody. I'm Dennis Stevens. I'm the chief methodologist and a co-founder of Leading Agile, um, happy to be here talking about some of the models that we use to make sure that we deliver transformations effectively. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So um, I want to try to set it up and then I'm going to kick it to you and just let you guys go with it. But at Leading Agile, we, we approach Agile transformation with a very intentional kind of mindset. There's a specific things that we believe in accomplishing in order to help a company evolve towards a more agile state. And, and, Part of that is this PEACER idea. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about what it is, what it stands for, and how it's gonna help with transformation. Let me, um, let me sort of set a little bit of context um, just at the top. So one of the things that we believe is that organizations um, can only really do this agile effectively if they make the organizational changes around it. They can't just change practice and culture. You gotta change the way your teams are formed. You've got to change the way that you govern decision-making. You've got to change the way that you measure and manage and continuously improve. There's a lot to it. Um, we also have found that we doing it incrementally and iteratively, doing slices of the organization at a time, sort of known endpoints, um, helps us create safety in the organization and sort of manage and organize the change and align everybody in the organization on the changes that we're making. So we have this concept of expeditions which are slices of the organization, typically aligned with something that a customer values and the customer can be an internal or external customer um, that we're moving together to form the teams, get the backlogs aligned and organized and then measure and manage the flow through those teams, right? These expeditions go towards specific targets that we call base camps. And we have a model internally that we use called outcomes-based plans, which are the um, like, one to two week increments of change that we're making within an expedition, a slice of the organization in order to um, help us successfully deliver change. There's like a very incremental and iterative, very intentional model that we're using to scale through the organization. That's important. People want to know where they're going, what's going to happen to them. And the people making the change want to be able to be successful and aligned in making that change. So we have this, we have this structure of change of moving outcomes um, over time and to make changes to the organization. So that's kind of a context starting point for how we're gonna talk about PEASTER today. Anything you wanna add that I left out there, Melissa? Uh, Nothing that I wanna add other than to say like, all of that is a mouthful and it's really hard. (laughs) Change is really hard and that's why we need this. So I want to ask a question about it. And I just want to, it's something I want to highlight for the folks that are listening. You talked about slices. And when I first heard people leading Agile talk about that, it kind of caught me by surprise. So you're talking about transformation, transforming an organization in basically a vertical slice, the same way we would encourage people to produce product, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, like a slice of the organization is, is portfolio, product delivery teams. We're talking about a, a part of the organization that aligns to deliver value that we okay. want to we want to move together, train, uh, reform, restructure, and coach in, as a group together. That's an expedition. Okay, and that's significant if you're listening because a lot of places just go in and like just make that team be agile. 
all by themselves. And then they're, they're agile, but they're surrounded by not agile and they can't do anything. And the change doesn't stick, right? Yeah, and it's really hard when you go down that path um, because you have these these teams, often scrum teams, trying to run scrum where everything around them hasn't changed. And they know that it's not working and they don't know why. And they don't know that they have the power to go change it. And that's why that vertical slice is so important. We need everything to change together so that we can create that that sticky change that you were talking about. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you going through that. All right, now, what does PEASTER stand for? What is it? So PEASTER stands for Prepare, Socialize, Tailor, Implement, and Reinforce. Okay. This is five steps. It's a change model or change framework? How do you, how do you refer to it? It's a change framework. Um, David, we actually run outcomes from outcome-based plan through it as a Kanban. So we're actually moving changes over time through those different steps. Okay. So these are the columns on a Kanban board. Yep. Okay. And so you're, as you're, you're moving to the group from one state to the next, um, all with this outcome in mind that we're this thing that we're trying to achieve. So there's a lot of parallels between what a scrum team might do. And you've even got a time box um, iteration that you're working in, right? Yep. Okay. So that, that should make it easier for people to digest this approach, I would think, despite the fact that change is hard. Does it help? We, we hope so. Yeah. I mean, we lose track of it sometimes. That's, that's intentionally modeled after what we ought to know as agile practitioners. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So would one of you be willing to walk us through how it starts? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and before we go down that, like, I really want to stress that, like, why we do this yeah. Is because this is something that like change, we can keep saying change is hard. We can't do change to our clients. Like we can't do change for our clients. We have to do change with our clients. And so when we think about what we're, why we're doing Peaster, why it's so important is because those who are being changed have to be fully participative, immersed, engaged, and on board. And so these are the steps that we we believe is the change framework that's necessary to create the conditions for that to happen. Okay. That's that's this is another thing where there's there's a lot of depth to it. They have to be side by side with you and going through yeah. this, like open to it, willing to it, including dealing with the fact that parts of it are going to be very uncomfortable. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. It is uncomfortable sometimes. Change change is uncomfortable because we're going from the known to the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. So how do we get started with it? So we start with prepare. And when we think about prepare, we're really thinking about what that future state vision is like, creating a hypothesis for how we're going to get to that that future state vision, and then gaining insight, like who are the people that we need to bring along on the journey with us? So as a change agent, prepare is, is is a big thinking step. It's, it's what are the things that I need to go do in order to realize that future state vision that I'm going to go try to go do. And it's anything from, you know, a big, like, how are we going to transform this whole organization down to the small, I'm going to go run a specific training or a specific workshop. And what do I need to go do to prepare for that? Okay. And each of these things, whether it's the workshop or the larger transformation effort, they're all driving towards that outcome. Like, I guess what I'm trying to get to is to be able to do any of this, there has to be a reason for it. You can't just want to go be agile. It's got to solve some business problem or some other thing that's not right. Absolutely. Do we need to give another example of prepare? Does that cover it? Well, I think there's two parts of prepare or what we're accomplishing to prepare. There's these two threads that are in my mind all the time as we're doing this. One of them is, what are we going to do to get the client to move? And the other one is, if you think about the coaching team, how is the coaching team going to align around it to make the change? So we're we're trying to make sure that our team has the same idea about what we're going to accomplish, how we're going to approve it, that our team knows what's available to us to go make that change, that our team is thinking ahead about what we're setting the stage for and what we need to know as we're in the prepare state. So the team is figuring out what they need to do to make the change. So if there's two simultaneous lenses going on. Okay. And the change we're going to make and how we're going to make it. 
I want to, I want to ask a question about this. So you just said that um, we've got to, you know, get, get the client to a point where they're basically ready to start doing this or motivated to start doing it. And, and the way that you said it made me think this is something the team's also got to be having conversations, not just like, what are we going to do? But they've got to psych themselves up for this as well. They've got to be able to see how it's possible, be getting some sort of reward out of it um, in terms of seeing the change or learning new things. I mean, that that's part of it too, right? That's part of that partnership. Well, so so in the P stage, we're thinking about how we're going to get the team aligned around it. Uh, Melissa's going to get to the next stage, the S, which is socialize. Okay. Socialize, that's exactly what we're doing. Oh, yep. all right. Look at that segue. I didn't even know I was doing that. All right. So maybe we can talk about socialize. Yeah. So like Dennis said, you know, the first part of socializing is getting alignment. So, you know, we have that hypothesis of, of what we're going to go do. Well, we've got to go now talk to people and get alignment to see, do they agree with it? Um, and they're going to give us feedback. Like they're absolutely going to give us feedback. We don't come in with the perfect solution every time. And we want that feedback. Uh, we want to socialize those changes to get to the place where we can get to that next state um, where we're co-creating the change. But like socialize is about getting all the right people coming together to align them um, towards the next step. Okay. So I have, I have a... A question I'd like to ask you about these two steps together. I'm going to give you a, a quote, hypothetical, unquote, situation. I am, uh, there's a client that I work with and they've been engaged in an agile transformation effort for quite a while. So they've been sending people to training for a long time. And there is amongst many portions of the organization, a belief that they're only being sent to training. That's the change is not happening at the higher levels of the organization there's also a large amount of technical debt that is impeding their ability to do much of anything in the way of Agile. And how would those two things fall into prepare and socialize? Like what, what kind of steps would you take to, to tackle that? So I would want to, so if I think about prepare, um, I think that the challenge that you're talking about is valid. And it goes back to the, what we were talking about earlier around like, we can't just go do a scrum team and then expect everything around it to change. Yeah. We can't just go send a bunch of people to training and then expect that they can go um, apply it in the system that they already have. So as a part of prepare, I would be thinking about those challenges and thinking about what the system is around all of those people and why they feel like that training isn't effective. And I would create a hypothesis for what would need to happen in the organization for them to change the system that they have change the, the way that they're structured, the way work flows through the system, the way that they're measured in order to get to that real change. Okay. And as a part of that, I would think about who are the people that are empowered to make those changes in the organization. And then as a part of Socialize, not only would I talk about, talk to the people who are really frustrated and feeling like they can't make those changes, but I'd also be looking to talk to those leaders who are empowered to make the change and start to align them around my hypothesis for what the conditions are that they have to go create in order for those trainings to now be effective in their organization. Okay. Now, is it safe to say that our teams are going to have a backlog of things that they want to be working on with this? Like if it's technical debt, all the different things they're going to have to address, or if it's leadership, all the people they're going to have to talk to or maintaining okay. something like that, right? Absolutely. Okay. And is that visible to the client? Yes, uh, it is visible to the client. Um, we have a piece built right into um, our navigator tool that we can bring up and have regular conversations um, with whichever group that we're, we're talking to and, and start looking at what we're moving through that piece Kanban. Oh, awesome. Okay. So, so they've got, I mean, it's not like a black box of transformation. You're actually showing them. All right, is there a way to track progress with this as well at this point, or does that come later on? Well, no, that's the, 
the way we track progress is by delivering the outcomes and the outcomes when they're delivered, there are measurable changes in behavior in the organization, observable changes in behavior in the organization. And at the base camp boundary, there's measurable um, changes. So we can, progress is we formed the teams. Are the teams formed? Yes. Do people know their roles? Yes. Are the meetings on their calendars? Yes. Are they able to stay together as a team? Yes. There's observable things at the end of formed teams. Um, Activate the backlog. Is the backlog actually in a tool? Yes. Are they able to manage it in their cadence meetings? Are they using it to track? So yeah, so there are things that are different in the organization than, than were before for each outcome. And we know that when we finish these outcomes, we're going to be able to have um, measurable improvements, for example, in predictability or in quality or in throughput um, that we can keep track of. So it's all measurable. Um, and the reason why it's important to we're measuring progress, we're demonstrating control, we're creating safety, um, sort of in the bigger in the bigger enterprise change or the sort of the Cotter change management view of the world, we're building organizational capital uh-huh. by being able to demonstrate progress and improvement. Okay. And that and that is just a big thing theme at leading agile in general is there has to be a way to prove we're having an impact in the organization. We can't just show up and work and not be able to prove that there's a change. Yeah. There's another cool thing about this, which is we're also doing it often with people that haven't worked with us for 15 years. Right. So Melissa and I have worked together for a long time. Worked yeah. together with some of these people for a long time. A lot of people haven't worked here for a long time. Some of the people that are operating this model don't even work for us. They work for the client or they work for, there are some contract that's been brought in. This model allows us to create a lot of team alignment around the change we're making and how to make the change as we're moving it forward. So it also creates, it creates it, it, we can measure progress and that measuring progress creates safety for people. But this model also creates safety, not just for the organization's changing, but for the coaches that are being asked to come and participate. Okay. So we're going through these steps in, in each of the one to two week increments. We're, we're going to cover all of these in each, each time segment. No, there's one, the, the time segment is how long it's in the implement state. Okay. Um, but what we're doing while we're doing the implement is we're doing prepare, socialize, and tailor of, of the next two or three. So we're okay. thinking about what we're going to do, how they fit together, soften the landing, creating clearing. Um, well, I, don't want, I don't want to steal the thunder from Taylor. We can hold off an increment. Yeah. Okay. I'll go back to Taylor because Taylor is super important. Um, and it really goes to the fact that every organization isn't cookie cutter. And not only that, even, even parts of your organization might have nuances. So when we talk about Taylor, we're talking about what are the, the customizations that we need to make in order to make it real and make it uh, make it safe. Like Dennis was yeah. talking about safety. Make what do we need to do to make it safe to now go and implement um, this in in this part of the organization? Okay. Can you give an example of like of something you need to make safe or somebody who would need something made safe? Because I have ideas in my head, but I'm not sure if they're. Oh, God. there's there's plenty of things. Like it it could be something as simple as a word. Um, so I've been working with a client for, for a while now and, and agile is a bad word and agility isn't. So okay. we, we make sure that we're talking about agility and we don't talk about agile because agile's become a bad word. So that's a super simple example where we're just customizing a, a you know, a word, but then, you know, I was working with a, a team, uh, a couple of months ago and they were, the work that they were doing was all services based. So it wasn't product-based. It was all about a service that they provided. So right. they were effectively waiting for um, you know, someone to, to ask for their services, and then they would go provide the service. So we had to change some of the governance model um, as we were thinking through you know, how were we going to go flow work through the system, because okay. that was a fundamentally different governance model for them versus a group that was providing a product that they were building for someone else. So I want to ask a, a kind of a riff on that. Um, one thing I've seen a lot in PMOs or in that middle layer is management decides they want to go agile. They tell the teams to be agile, but nobody tells the people in the middle. And when the teams start handing up burn down charts, they're like, no, 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 we need, we need Gantt charts. Or, or I mean, this is a really simplistic example, but 
the, there's a layer that still feels like it's supposed to provide the old metrics to management, even though no one's working that way anymore. I think there's there's a few aspects that that probably isn't directly a Peaster conversation, although that would be something we would talk about is who do we have to get familiar with the new metrics? Because we're also, you know, we're kind of running these themes across the top too, Dave. Yeah. Um, but the like the things that the PMO has to produce um, in order to create safety for the organization or to meet with their compliance rules, they might still have to produce. So we have okay. to, sometimes we have to go figure out how to align those things. Um, what would happen, and I know you're talking about this because of a tailoring thing, what would happen is understanding that theme, the narrative that we've created around that in the organization and where they are, that yeah. insight would come into how we did it at Taylor because we might actually teach something different in Taylor early on than we teach later on because the language has changed or the uh, level to accept it. Their maturity is evolved. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I, I apologize. I don't think my example was super clear. I was trying to get to the part where there's somebody who feels like they're still being held to the old ways, even though they're told we're doing the new ways and you would create safety for them to maybe not have to provide everything they used to provide. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get them to provide what we agreed with the PMO was necessary for them to be successful. Okay. Yep. Okay. And I think it's important to take that back to the vertical slice because a lot of that, what you're talking about, where that comes into play is when you don't yeah. really have a vertical slice. Ah, that was good. <laughs> that was very good. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So that's Taylor. And now we're going to talk about implement. This is the one we sort yes. of jumped into a little early. That was my fault. I apologize. But now we're going to go do stuff. Now we're going to go do stuff. And, and you jumped in, but that's where everybody wants to jump. And so that's actually a, a good public service announcement for you've got to go through the earlier steps or you're going to get to implement and you're not going to get the results you want. So you've got to prepare, socialize, and tailor before you do implement. Uh, so implement, you know, when we start talking about our outcomes-based plans, you know, where we're running those outcomes through one to two week sprints, where whatever that is for, for a particular organization, that is we're actually now doing the outcome or we're uh, doing something else. Whatever it is that we're implementing, we are focusing on making sure that we are installing the system or uh training the right people or doing workshops, having the right focus um, to get people immersed in the change that we're trying to make so that we can get the benefits that we were looking for when we initially went through the prepare stage. Okay. So immerse is a really important word to me there. I mean, you're basically trying to dip them into this entirely new environment, new way of working. And I'm assuming you're still doing some kind of adjusting and tailoring as you're going through this, right? Absolutely. If you find that, you know, you get on the ground and something isn't quite right, absolutely, you, should, you should pivot and not just follow the plan blindly. Okay. But if you've done your, if you've done the work right, that should be the uh, exception rather than the rule. Okay. And how do you protect against things like the cargo cult type of approach where everybody's like kind of going through the paces but when you talk to them, you can tell it's just not really getting in there. Well, as much as possible, we want to tie this to the work that they're doing. So it's not I'm giving you, you know, giving you something and then you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I got to go back to my day job. We're tr we, we give them a tool. So like we teach them the tool and yep. then immediately apply it to the work that they're doing so that they can see how the, the work that they're doing gets better or easier or whatever the right word is there, but it's, it's a part of their day job and not something they're learning that they can't immediately apply. Okay. And there's, there's a couple other pieces of safety built around that, Dave. One of them is when we're doing the prepare and socialize as a team, yeah. we're like saying, do they believe what we need them to believe? And if not, socialize is part of walking them down their, their belief system and walk them up the new belief system. No, this is why we're doing it this way. We're not really, we're not going to do the same thing that we've always done and just give it agile words. We're going to do something different. Yeah. We'll get there. So every concept has a different sort of walk to get there. The other thing is, is when we get into reinforce and we do the assessment, the, the assessment observes if actually they're doing the things the way we want them to. It doesn't observe, did, are they doing, have they completed training? It's, can we kind of look at their backlog and see if it looks like this? Are they able to deliver something 
frequently actually looks like this. Are they able to actually manage their dependencies? Can they make and keep a sprint commitment? So the assessment protects against cargo cold agile as well. And in the reinforce step, we show them how we're measuring it. We show them how the metrics measure it. Um, and, and we're able to see if they're actually, if they've actually changed or if they're still doing just the same thing and calling it something different. Okay. In the scenario that I brought up earlier about the company where, you know, there's a lack of belief that management is changing. One of the things that I tried to do with them was to, from the people on the teams, get information like what, what evidence would show you that management was changing? Because I know for a fact that their entire management of the organization was also going through transformation and changing. Like they were applying themselves. They were trying. There just wasn't trust. Well, here's, here's, the, the, thing team they don't here's the things I don't believe. Um, you're going to pull my team apart, put me on 37 projects at one time. No, we're not. We're going to form a stable team and keep it together. And then if that happens, management is changing. If it doesn't, management isn't changing. We're not going to force you to do 40 times what you have the capacity. We're going to put in a system that balances capacity demand. We either do it or we don't. We're going to um, allow you to um, factually report your status early so we can pivot rather than hide everything in a game of plausible deniability because management is not going to use metrics to pick on you anymore. And so either management does it or they don't. Okay. So it, it, and so what we're doing at the same time is we're running these master classes. We're coaching the leadership. We've created a transformation leadership team around the expedition and we're working with them and coaching them daily. So how they have to lead differently for it to run. Okay. So something that might not be super apparent to the folks listening here is what this means is that in the same way that management's got to learn to trust the teams, the teams have to learn to trust management. And when that gets fractured, that's obviously going to cause issues. And I'm assuming that in this phase is also that part where I always feel like when you go into transformation, there's that moment when the coyote runs off the cliff and looks down and, you know, holds up the little sign that says, Oh my, and then crashes to the ground. Like people run out and they look down, and there's no ground and they're like, ah, but then all of a sudden they just keep going because it's agile and that works, but nobody believes that's going to happen until they do it. Yeah. And, and I would just add to what Dennis said is like the, the people on the ground need to remember that the leaders, the managers, they're people too. And that change is hard. Like I was working with a, a, a team a couple of years ago and we you know spent a whole lot of time making sure that all the work was flowing through the system and there we were, we were getting rid of all the shoulder taps. Yeah. And then this leader came in and tapped on a shoulder and like it caused all of this insanity and like people just went down a rabbit hole and they're like, the leaders aren't changing. Oh, my yeah. goodness. <laughs> and uh, and so I went to the leader and they like, like literally on a video call, smacked their head and went, I can't believe I did that. Wow. Like, it, it was just it was a habit. It's what they always did. Yeah. And like, you got to, sometimes you got to like, maybe ask like, Hey, should we be doing this? Should we be doing the new system? And we need those, the people on the ground to feel safe, to have those conversations with their leaders so that it, they, they can start to reinforce those changes because changing is hard for the leaders too. And, and safe to hold each other accountable as well. Yeah. Right? Like safe for a team member. To, one time I worked with a team and they were having a daily scrum and this executive came in and started to interrupt and all seven people held their hands up, like, you know, talk to the hand and said, you're not allowed to interrupt us. Like all together at one time. I was like, that was amazing. Because awesome. up until then, they'd been terrified of that person. Yeah, um, there's there's some interesting, there's an interesting thread um, in your in your question which everything that we're doing around creating expeditions and base camps and outcomes and metrics and assessments is to make the system be trustworthy because the teams don't trust management, but management has things that they're accountable for delivering as well. Yeah. And when the teams haven't done that again and again and again, the management doesn't understand, the leadership doesn't understand, they're responsible for the design of that system. So we are educating back and forth. It's like it's like it's like um, the yin and yang of it is really complicated, right? But your perspective, the way you're kind of approaching the question, is this: if management would just trust the teams, we would be successful. Yeah, um, but that isn't true. If the teams don't have a system that can operate, effectively, management's job is to build a system that can be trusted and to work with the teams and put them in a position 
to be successful. So when we don't teach management that and expect the teams just figured out management to magically change, like trust the team, they will be successful is not advice that we give to our clients. Our advice we give our clients is if we can build a system that is trustworthy, we can learn to trust it and exploit it to maximize value to your customer. So help us do that collaboratively. We're not doing it without them. We're doing it with them. So in our system of transformation, we have a steering committee of executives involved. We have the managers that you're talking about in TLTs engaged in leading the change. So a big part of the socialize is that work. It's not just getting the teams to do something differently, delivery teams to do something differently. It's getting the whole stack and the ecosystem around it to operate in a new direction. Does it make sense? It does. So what is TLT? The transformation leadership team is the managers of the people that are going through the transformation. Those managers are engaged and involved. They are the ones that are helping steer and guide the outcomes through the peace tier. Socialize is not just going to talk to the teams. It's talking to their bosses and their managers and all the stakeholders that have to be aligned. So as we're moving these things across, we have, we have broad alignment and broad agreement on where we're going and how we're going to get there. So we're not running into these problems frequently. We do sometimes. We're not frequently running into these problems where managers are surprised and don't know how the new system operates because they are part of making the change. Yeah. Um, so so that we don't necessarily believe that we go tell managers, just trust the team, the teams will be successful. We teach them, if we can create this system and it's successful, will it meet your needs as well? Yes. Okay, let's go do this together. Make sense? It, it does. It's that, to me, that's a, like a really massive point. And it's one of those things about working here that makes me, I always feel like I'm a bit of a process fanboy, but um, so many times I was at places where it was just what you said, teach, you know, the team, people on the teams would be like, if they would just trust us, everything would be fine, but there's no system to do anything in that could be fine. Nobody talks about a system. So the fact that there's even that conversation happening, letting, let alone a system is being created that positions them for success. That's a huge thing. Yeah. And that's a really good segue into the R of Easter, which is reinforce. So it's not good enough that we just go implement it. In reinforce, we're looking for the measurements of whatever value it is that we think we were going to, or we thought we were going to get out of it. So we have to be able to show that with metrics. And if we can't, like if we find that we haven't done enough, we've got to go, you know, uh, alter the plan. You know, whether it's we didn't, uh, you know, we need another uh, we need another training or we just need more practice, Uh, whatever that is, we've got to go do it so that ultimately we can achieve those results and show them and celebrate them in the organization. And and teach them to maintain it after we leave. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Is that the whole thing? Do we get all of it? There are three levels of reinforce that we're doing at the end of an outcome. The first one is to reinforce showing the team that they're empowered, showing the change they made, giving them credit for the work they've done, getting management to support it. There's like there's like the the local change reinforcement they're doing. There's an organizational level um, of change management reinforcement we're doing, which is getting human capital, hardening things into policy, making sure that we're aligned and um, not operating with exceptions within the organization, changing the things around it within the reinforce. And then there's like a lean change reinforced, which is going and tightening up um, the way that we went about making the change, improving the processes that we've left behind. Like there's kind of a cleaning up aspect of it as well. So reinforce happens at multiple levels, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. And I guess the, the thing that I was just thinking about as you were talking through that is with the fact that this is being kind of visualized for everyone to see and the work is being tracked the organization can see its evolution towards a more agile state step-by-step. Step. It's not just like, oh, are they agile yet? Like they can, they can see the change happening. Yeah, they're participating in it. And, they, and they, that, 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 that big part of getting incremental progress and incrementally them seeing that their world is different, it empowers the teams, it gives management um, support, it gives executives energy to support it because we're buying organizational capital with it as we're going. So, so this, this piece is at the point of execution, as we've talked about in the outcomes, but it's yeah. part of an overall system of transformation for the organization. You know, one of the things we absolutely believe 
is you can't train your way into an agile organization. Ooh. All right. right. Training, training practices first is a failure mode, right? Training and practice is a failure mode. Culture first is a failure mode. We have to change the system. The system encompasses the whole stack of work, including management. And so our model is targeted at moving the organization to a new state. I just, I just want to check in on this, uh, partly because I'm a trainer, but <laughs> you're not saying that training and culture aren't important, but they don't work without the system in place, right? Yeah. Yes. At no, at, at no, the only, the only way that training produces results is if you have management aligned around it, the teams are formed, right. You've got the governance of people are monitoring it. You can go teach people practices all day, but if they're in conflict with the organization itself, it's going to fail. If, yeah. if, if, if we go teach something that requires a person on the team, whose job is to protect the team from management, that process change is going to fail eventually yeah. because because it isn't about protective management. It's about, it's about creating a system that accomplishes what the organization needs to. And that's all the way up and down the stack. Well, and teaching people how to use stuff they don't get a chance to use isn't really very helpful at all. That's right. And telling people to trust a team that isn't trustworthy or to trust management that doesn't understand their system yeah. is also not going to fly in the face of human nature. So it's, it's, about, um, it's about systemically and intentionally aligning all these things as we're moving through. And we do it in the small through P stir with outcomes. But that same concept can be used higher, at higher levels in the organization. Right. Is there anything from this that, that we missed that you both feel like people should know about? No, the thing that's interesting to me, Dave, um, as, as we look at this, is this concept of, well, how do I overcome the challenge I've had in the past? Because I sent my team to scrum training and they all came back certified and we weren't successful. Yeah. Or we went and did this. There's, this. there's this thing that I think people are looking for is why those things didn't work is because that's like a practices-based implementation. It misses the system around it. And it misses the intentionality of who are my stakeholders? How do I align them? So prepare, socialize, tailor. All those things are happening, not just for the team, but for all the people around the team. Then yeah. we go implement when we have people aligned around it. Does that make sense? So the P yeah, totally does. The PST is critical in the eye. So the reason why training-based transformation fails it's because the things you train them on, they can't practice or they don't work there or they're in conflict with policies or it, it's one, one tiny slice of it because we're still on projects getting demand from 100 different people and can't ever deliver anything. Like no amount of training solves that. Yeah. Right? Fixing our team design, putting a flow of, of work model and a decision rights model into place, the governance model in place, and then measuring managing flow. That's how you create conditions where those practices are successful and that culture can then be coached and emerge. Cool. Um, Melissa, anything that we missed? I can't think of anything else that we missed. All right. Well, I really appreciate you both taking time out to do this. I know you, you have to run, but um, Melissa, if folks want to get in touch with you to follow up with questions, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, best way to reach me is either via LinkedIn. I'm Melissa Oberg um, on LinkedIn, or you can reach me through my Leading Agile email, melissa.oberg at leadingagile.com. All right. Thank you. And Mr. Stevens? Yeah, and you can go to the website, contact us page on Leading Agile's website, or you can email me at dennis at leadingagile.com. All right. I appreciate you both. Thank you very much for your time today. 